because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm your host, Alex Epstein. I'm joined by Don Watkins in Pennsylvania. Hey, Don. Hey, Alex. And Stefan Henna in Germany. Hey, Stefan. Hello. So you guys might be able to tell I am a little bit sick today. And this actually relates to a topic that I'm currently obsessed with, which is basically air pollution and human health. So I want to give in a minute a really, really strong book recommendation, one of the strongest book recommendations I could ever give since I just read a book and I regard it as really unique in terms of making sense of air pollution, how to think about it, how to make policies about it. Uh, but before I tell you about the book, let me just tell you about my own context thinking about this besides being sick at the moment. And it's that I'm working on Moral Case for Fossil Fuels version 2.0. And one of the sections that I really want to improve in the book is the section on non-CO2 emissions. So there's a section on CO2 emissions and climate, and there's a lot I want to improve there. But probably the part of the first book I was most, I was least satisfied with was the section on other environmental issues. And those are really, really important for at least two reasons. One is that those issues, it's really important to get environmental laws right. Because on the one hand, it's really possible to have things like damaging air pollution, damaging water pollution, negative safety practices, and those can really make people sick or even kill people. So it's there's, it's not like CO2 or CO2 is benign when it's around you. The only question is what happens in the global climate system. Like There are these really powerful uh, forces that can really harm people. So it's important to get that right but then it's important to do that in a way that's not compromising in any significant way your ability to get abundant, reliable energy very, very affordably and on a large scale. And usually what happens is that the people talking about different kinds of environmental emissions and risks, the, the tendency tends to be to hugely exaggerate those risks Often, there's just a huge amount of sloppiness, including people act like all risks apply to all uses of fossil fuels. So they'll take like uh, smog in China and say, oh, well, this this is true of all fossil fuels. And well, no, it's clearly not true of natural gas or even oil or even modern coal plants. It's a specific, it's a specific use of coal in specific ways in China, which arguably you don't uh, have to do. So there's just all this sloppiness about to what extent there's an issue, um, a complete misunderstanding of, of the modern technology and best practices that exist to minimize different kinds of side effects and risks. So it's hard on that end. And then on top of that, when people are thinking about these issues, so they're not precise about the negative byproducts of fossil fuels. And then people who are talking about the negative byproducts of fossil fuels almost never talk about the unique positives that come along with those byproducts. So when you are using coal plants, you have reasons to use coal plants. And for many people, that's by far the cheapest way of them getting electricity. And if you just look at what happens with the sulfur dioxide in the air, then you're not getting the whole story because it's, it's very, very possible that particularly if you use a modern kind of plant, that even if there's something imperfect about the air emissions, that overall, your life is much, much better because when you have abundant, reliable energy, you have so much capability to improve your life in every different way. And so not only can you afford things to mostly neutralize things like uh, smog, so that's what you know China's starting to make cleaner air, but you can also offset or, or overwhelm negative impacts. For example, you can pay for better food and you can pay for better shelter, you can pay for better medical care. And so overall, your life can be much, much better, even if you do have a certain amount of emissions that out of context is not good, but in context could be very good. So it's so, so hard to get people to talk about the fossil fuel emissions with precision and in context. Th those are the two elements that I just find very difficult. And then that's really annoying because 
these issues get very, very complicated very quickly. And it's so it, it's kind of a pain to try to sort through them. And particularly since it's not my my life's work to know all of the details of all of these things, it's it's hard to get the level of precision that I want uh, from experts and, you know, let alone context, which most experts don't don't give you. And yet occasionally in life, you'll find that in a particular field, there is somebody who looks at things with precision and context. And I remember for me in the field of energy it was Peter Beckman of Access to Energy. He really had a different level of precision and context. Now, I haven't read most of the stuff I read. Most of the stuff I read by him was 10 years ago. So I may have different assessments of it now to some degree, but in general, he had a lot of precision and and context. And part of that context is that his overall his overarching priority was human life. And one problem you have with many thinkers today is that their their overarching priority is minimizing human impact on nature. And that's, in my view, not the right priority. And it certainly leads to policies that that are bad for for human life. So now let me get to the the thinker and the book that I'm really excited about. A few months ago or so, I saw a, a video by a guy named Robert Phelan, P-H-A-L-E-N, and he happens to teach at the University of California at Irvine, which is pretty near where I live, so I'm hoping to meet him at some point soon. And he had this half an hour talk, which you, you can very easily find on YouTube because he only has two or three talks on YouTube, unfortunately. And I was just so impressed by the precision and context he gave when he was explaining certain things about what's called the PM controversy, particulate matter, which is a certain kind of air pollution. But part of the issue is it's very vaguely defined. It's defined primarily as the size of the compounds involved versus any particular chemical property, which, as he points out, is, is a very problematic way of defining something in the first place, because you could you could have a bunch of PM in different places, but it could be totally different things with totally different kinds of impacts on your body, and yet you're calling it all PM. So that's one of many things he pointed out. And I found this guy there. I could see that this was a super, super respected expert and had a lot of rigor, and yet he was completely unafraid of being iconoclastic. And I just noticed that the way he explained things was very precise and and very in context. For example, he would just make the point in passing, but this is such a, an important point, that when you're making policies to reduce emissions, you need to look at the full benefits of those policies and also the full harms of those policies. And he mentioned things like the value of industry to human life and human health. And that is a kind of obvious thing, but rarely specialists, particularly who talk in the public, who are specialists in environmental issues will very clearly state that we absolutely, when making these decisions, need to recognize the fundamental benefits of industry to human life. So I just thought, oh, there's something there's something really remarkable about this guy in terms of his precision, his context, his pro-human orientation. And then I made a big mistake, which is basically that I didn't immediately read his stuff and this is this is a big kind of mistake to make, and I, I hate when I make it because when when we find somebody who's on another level, I, I just find it so good to just immerse myself in that person because there are very few people who are this good. So recent in the last week, I finally started reading one of his books, which is called it, it's pretty much the Particulate Matter Air Pollution Controversy. Those words might be in a different order, but by Robert Phelan, and it's just. It's an amazing book. It's it's so good. There's the there's this phenomenon that occasionally happens to me when I love a book, and this is the most extreme yet, where I highlight so much of it in Kindle that when I go to my online Kindle highlights, it just by the end of the book, it just says, You can't see this, you can't see this, you can't see this, because you've highlighted too many things. Cause I just found my found myself highlighting the almost the entire book because it's so precise. And it has so much context. He's just systematically looking at every aspect of air pollution and and how it affects human life and what are the different policies to deal with it and how they affect human life. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of places where I think that that it's unique. Actually, here, here's what I'll do. I'll just give you, he has a section which is fascinating near the end of the book where he talks about certain assumptions that are being made. 
and he just lists out these assumptions and then he questions them. So I'll just read you some of the assumptions and maybe from this you can see, oh, this is this is a really interesting kind of thinker. So I'll give you a couple, several of the assumptions that he gives and then summarize what I think are some of the interesting views he says. So one is, he says, an agent shown to be toxic at high doses is, is also harmful at low doses. So this is something we've actually talked about on Power Hour before, which is the issue of thresholds of toxicity. And he points out that this belief so all of these things are are assumptions that he's questioning. An agent shown to be toxic at high doses is also harmful at low doses. And he questions that and shows that this is this is not the way that reality works. And yet so much of modeling of health is based on the idea that if a large quantity of something is harmful, then a small quality of something is harmful just to a lesser degree. And he has a related one, which is when large populations face small per person risks, the total risk is the product of the large number of people and the small risk per person. Now, this one's actually a little tricky, so I don't want to go too much into it, but he gives this really good example of uh, the phenomenon of if you're, this also relates to the first point, if you're looking at, say, oxygen, you know, oxygen in the air we breathe is about 21%, and yet having 100% oxygen in the air can be totally toxic. And so if you said, well, oxygen at 100% kills people, and then you say, well, we have 21% of the level that can easily kill people, then a huge number of people should be dropping dead every day if we just try to do these sim simplistic multiplication and division. I just thought, oh, this is, he's just making this point, which is such a good point, and yet the wrong assumption is so present. Another one that's really big is, here's another assumption. He says, any stress is harmful to health and must be minimized. So this is the idea that this is related. It's that, well, anything that we put in the atmosphere is, you know, it's that, that does anything to the body, stresses it in any way must be harmful. And then he points out, well, but this is, this is the opposite of what we find in many cases, like with exercise, we're stressing the body to strengthen the body. And then there's a lot of findings in microbiology that you want to stress different parts of the immune system. When people are born on farms, they might have stronger immune systems and that there are similar things with air quality. So if you actually, if you put people in a clean room for days and days and days, then their ability to deal with any kind of particles or anything else becomes dramatically lower because certain cells regenerate and they can in a weak way without certain resistances. And then if you put them into the real world, they people will be very much at risk. So he points out that certain amounts of natural contamination are inevitable in terms of the wind blowing dust or certain things in agriculture or fires. And thus, because certain amounts of emissions in the world are inevitable, that there's probably a baseline amount of emission that you want to be exposed to on a regular basis so that you're not you're not so weak. And this is just the kind of thing, who thinks about this? It makes so much sense when he says it, but I didn't even really think about this before. Another one, which is which just shows how pro-human he is, he questions the assumptions that, quote, natural chemicals are inherently safer than anthropogenic chemicals. And he points out that people are just acting with emissions. They'll just look almost exclusively at man-made emissions and then not look at all of the natural sources of emissions. And yet there are plenty of natural things that are way more dangerous than man-made things. And different kinds of natural uh, emissions like ozone will often exist in much higher concentrations naturally than human beings add. But then if we say that they're too high, then we force us to reduce significant activities like, I think in this case, using diesel engines. And he just points out that you, you can't assume that something natural is safe and that something anthropogenic is unsafe. And yet so many experts in the field do this. Another one he says is, another assumption is contaminant concentrations can be controlled below levels that harm even sensitive individuals. So this is the idea that, well, we need to keep reducing amounts of emissions because at a certain point, and they'll point out, oh, there are certain people who are old or young or really sick, especially, and we want to save them. And yet he points out, well, for certain people, they're just sensitive to anything, to basically anything. And so those people have to take individual measures, and it's really, really damaging to tr to do things uh, to keep lowering emissions at large cost, which diminishes people's capability in every aspect of life because it diminishes their their resources. In the name of in the name of helping everyone, it, when you can't even help everyone in this kind of generalized way. So I thought that was a fascinating thing. 
And another one is contaminants should be isolated and regulated one by one as a means of protecting health. So this is that, and this I found really interesting. So just that, oh, we should focus on sulfur dioxide and focus on different nitrogen oxides. And he he's very focused, particularly I think in his current thinking on when you're considering restricting something, you need to look at the full context, the, the total impact of that restriction and see what its overall consequence is on human life. And so if you're just saying, oh, well, here's what sulfur dioxide should be in a vacuum, that's very problematic because you're you're not looking at cost benefit and also you're not looking at what happens to other kinds of contaminants certain ones where you lower one it ends up raising others and then the final one of the assumptions that he has here and there are tons of others he questions in the book but this is just this one section is quote the most recent science is the best science unquote and this i found totally fascinating because he just goes into the point that cutting edge science is often a total mess because when people are proposing recent findings and doing new experiments they don't there are so many things that can go wrong they just there hasn't been the rigorous study and questioning and back and forth and verification replication all of these different things that exist in science when you're dealing with the most recent science it it has the potential to advance science but any given at any given point it can be by far not the thing that you want to pay attention to. And yet there's this idea that, oh, let's let's pay attention to this cutting edge study on air pollution or on climate. And his point of view is, no, you really need to rethink that. You want to be dealing with established science, and then you want to be looking at the full context. So this is just, I, I don't feel like I've done justice at all to this book. So I'll just say that that this guy is really remarkable in terms of how he's just got this incredible expertise and rigor, but then he has this broader thinking method where he's looking at issues in terms of a pro-human perspective. He's looking at the full context of everything, and he's got an incredible amount of precision. So I'm not sure that this book will be interesting to everyone, but I certainly would recommend looking him up on YouTube, and I'm hoping I can interview him for my book and also for the next uh, for a future episode of Power Hour, because I, I really do find him to be a unique mind today. So it, we should definitely take advantage of him. Stefan, I know that you've, how much of Phelan have you read so far? I know that you watched a little bit. I watched the same videos that you recommended. I haven't read the book yet, but I'm, I've also watched some other videos by him, but they were not as good as the, the one that you mentioned. But it's I really enjoy his his thinking and explaining and uh, the way he views this issue with much expertise and uh, a different angle than normally regulators take. Okay, let's go to the stories of the week. Don, get us started. All right. So March fifteenth, just a few days ago, uh, <laughs> more than what is that? Not true. No, that was just me coughing because I'm. Oh, sick. I thought that was a laugh. I was. <laughs> oh no, no, no! Sorry, I don't. I'm not not a big ridiculer. No, so go on. March fifteenth, uh, one point four million young people around the world went on strike from school in order to protest climate change, and this got a lot of glowing press coverage. And I went through and read the uh, U.S. protesters manifesto, and I'm not going to quote it at length. I think most of it's pretty predictable, but here's two sentences that kind of summarize it. We're striking because if the social order is disrupted by our refusal to attend school, then the system is forced to face the climate crisis and enact change. With our futures at stake, we call for radical legislation to combat climate change and its countless detrimental effects on the American people. And then it goes to outline demands, which include the Green New Deal, no more fossil fuel infrastructure projects, declaring a national emergency on climate change. And then this one, I... This was a new one for me, but compulsory, comprehensive education on climate change and its impacts throughout K, grades K through eight. And I mean, I, I, I've heard people mock this and I can somewhat sympathize, but to me, this is just really tragic because it's, they've been so uneducated and miseducated that nowhere in these many, many words on this dire climate threat is there any hint of appreciating the importance of energy? And then there's just this conviction that they're seeing life presently decay because of climate when, as 
we've highlighted on this show again and again, our ability to cope with climate has been improving over time, not degrading. And so there's just this enormous ignorance that is, I, I find, uh, quite depressing. And then I find it even more depressing that people who are more well-informed and should know better are cheering this on as if we should actually be influenced by what is frankly the like ignorant outpouring of frustration by people who don't understand the issues. One thing I've been thinking about lately that's somewhat related to this is just that is that CO2 emissions in a substantial way are a choice that we all make. That is, everyone who chooses to live in modern civilization is choosing to emit massive amounts of CO2 by the standard of what people say is acceptable. And this applies definitely to the unreliable sources of energy, which people think that they use way more than they do, but also when they use them because of the phenomenon of life support from fossil fuels and because of the phenomenon of the unreli unreliables actually make the fossil fuels a lot less efficient uh, because they have the up and down you know, erratic usage, the stop and go traffic phenomenon. And then also because the unreliables are almost exclusively produced and manufactured and transported and mined using fossil fuels, all of us are choosing to use a massive amount of fossil fuels and to emit a massive amount of CO2. And I'm finding more and more that it's it's really important to have that as part of the discussion and to recognize, hey, we're all choosing to do this because we think it's the best thing for our lives versus to say, we only industry is choosing to do this. Industry is forcing this on us and we are not participating in it. And in fact, we're on strike. So you have this phenomenon of kids are cutting class. They're calling that a strike, uh, which is interesting because we're subsidizing uh, it. So, you know, they're, they're cutting class and then they're, and what are they doing when they're cutting class? I mean, they're, they're using fossil fuels in one form or another, whether they're just hanging out, screwing around, pay, playing video games, going to restaurants, uh, being on the internet, whatever it is, they are choosing to use a lot of uh, fossil fuels and yet they are blaming people for it. And this is, it's just a, it's a dangerous phenomenon in a society where everybody can be doing something and yet many of, if not most of the people now who are doing the thing are disowning the nature of it and then blaming other people for it. Because it, it, if you have that, then you've got this phenomenon of we're all choosing to do something. And it's it's a pretty rational choice to be using fossil fuels to the extent we are and to be saying, in effect, when somebody comes up with something better, yeah, we'll use that, but we're not going to ruin our lives uh, by really trying to rely on unreliable energy or something like that. And, and yet, so everyone is doing a fairly rational thing, and yet they're they're talking about it as if they're not, and as if the thing that they're doing using fossil fuels isn't necessary. And then, so they're much more willing to agitate for and vote for things that would actually prevent us from doing this thing that they choose to do. And that that's what's scary about these 100% renewable policies. Nobody is remotely doing 100% renewable, and yet people can delude themselves into thinking that they're close to that, and then they can mandate it. And then to the extent the mandate is honest in terms of 100% renewable or something close to that, it's it's very, very destructive. So one, one thing I would just like these kids to know is that you know, you and your your parents in particular, like if you really want to do something about this, if you really think this is so urgent, then you know, the thing to do is to move to a third world country or or to just live as minimally uh, as possible. But you are choosing right now to use fossil fuels, which I think is a really good choice. But if, if you think it's a really bad choice, then then that's the thing uh, to do, but not to not to use fossil fuels now and then deprive others of the right to use it through your bad and ignorant perspective. Stefan, what's your first story today? Uh, my story is about Oregon. So the Oregon uh, House uh, just passed a bill that preemptively puts a 10-year moratorium on fracking. And it's currently uh, considered by the Senate of the state. Uh, and there are currently the context is that currently there are no fracking wells in Oregon. But there's some natural gas potential in the Willamette Valley. And the Oregon House actually approved the ban by white bipartisan margin of 42 to 12 votes on uh, March 18th, last Monday. 
Um, and other states that have already banned it are New York, Vermont, and Maryland. And Florida and New, New Mexico are considering bans. So this is a sort of growing movement on state in state legislatures that are banning fracking, even if there's no fracking currently taking place in the state. So do you think this is going to, to, to what extent do you think this will influence places where there is real potential? I mean, obviously we see New York, there's real potential, at least with gas, and they are restricting that. Well, it's difficult to estimate this because I'm not, uh, of course, an expert on every state legislature and, and also the public opinions in, in every American state. But it's, I think it's a bad it's a really bad sign that even states that don't currently experience any fracking activity are already already have these wide margins of hostility against this uh, this practice. And also, one of the arguments was we have to study this further before we you know can assess all these impacts. And that's interesting because the, the fracking boom, of course, has been taking on for like ten years now in the United States. And there's plenty of opportunity to study the precise uh, or potential concerns and you know see them in context of Oregon's geology. Yeah, and, and to go back to what I was talking about with Robert Phelan and looking at, at environmental policies in the full context, there's plenty known uh, about the impacts of restricting industry in terms of restricting productivity, uh, certainly that that restricts tax receipts and then restricting unemployment. And then unemployment is just hugely correlated to all sorts of negative kinds of things. So it's, it's just this thing where people have this, this idea that restricting industry is a morally unchallengeable phenomenon and really a risk-free phenomenon, whereas my default is to view it as a terrifying phenomenon. To, to restrict, I mean, because to restrict industry is just to restrict really efficient, really productive activity. And what you want to do is you want to deal with the fact that, yes, yeah, sometimes that activity can truly endanger somebody. So you want laws specifically against the endangerment, or it might be some, some version of the activities generating side effects that are not that are not worth it because there's there's some alternative that doesn't have the side effects. So either you know you you modify like the coal technology to have less side effects, or maybe in some case you you know you use a different technology. So there there are cases where you want you want the laws to intel it to lead to an intelligent use of industry, but where you're saying thou shalt not drill for oil and gas using modern technology, which is in effect what fracking is, that is that is a really, really scary kind of thing. Don, what's your next story? Well, I figured we should uh, start talking about something that's going to come up more and more in this show, which is the uh, 2020 election. And uh, I remember back in 2016, I think you were hopeful and even wrote a piece on how Republicans could make energy a winning issue for them that year. And of course, if we remember back, energy basically played almost no role in the election. But there's pretty uh, wide agreement that this election, it will play a major issue, particularly the issue of climate change, where we have, um, by my count, all 13 of the announced Democratic candidates have endorsed in one extent or another the Green New Deal. And in fact, six of the senators running for president uh actually were co-sponsors of the Green New Deal. And the the Republicans, on the other hand, are very seem very eager to make the Green New Deal a um, an issue in the election because they think they can use it to portray the Democrats as radicals and the Democrats think that they can use cl climate issue to beat down Trump and other uh, GOP members as denialists. And so um, there, I think there's going to be a real, it's very clear that even if you take John Hickenlooper, who was the former Colorado governor, who while he's in office was one of the better Democrats uh, around today on issues of oil and gas, even he's come out and supported in a kind of vague way, the urgency of the Green New Deal, as he calls it. There, so it's, it, it's clear where they're kind of congregating and certainly Trump's position is known, but Republicans more broadly, as we've talked about, are still kind of 
looking for a coherent position. And it seems that a lot of what they want to do right now is not really take a position on climate, but just focus on the expense and, you know, socialism, as they would put it, of the Green New Deal. And I think that uh, what, uh, you know, I would really urge is staking out a coherent, as we would put it, 100, not just on climate, but just a wider pro-freedom, pro-human um, policies, then, and then to have a really coherent position of climate falling under that. And I have not really seen any indication that that is going to happen, but I think that that is uh, an opportunity and missing it will be a real detriment. Yeah. I'm really thinking about how do you, how do you influence this? I mean, this is, I'll, I'll tell you how scary this is to me where I thought last week, I thought for the first time, hmm, maybe I should run for office at some oh, point. No. Or, or as if you know me, that is, is the last thing that holds any appeal uh, to me. I mean, for a, a whole number of, uh, of reasons. And, and yet it's just, yeah, you can see that there's this one idealistic side that's advocating this absolute destruction. And then the other side is kind of hoping that, yeah, they're, they've moved so far that, well, people will see that they're crazy and then they'll vote for us as non-crazy, which is a total zero type thing. Like we're just the absence of something bad. And yet, yet there is this opportunity to take the high ground. And at the very least, there's just such a transparent opportunity to take the high ground on the decriminalization of nuclear power. So I just, let me just tell everybody, particularly if there are any Republican operatives listening to this, or I mean, Democrat, if you want to run for president as a Democrat and use this, then I'll be happy to advise you uh, as well, free of charge. But just the uh, the idea that, I mean, the, the way to think of CO2 emissions, if you don't know anything about the specifics of them is just that the only ethical way to reduce CO2 emissions is in a way that uh, is by finding cost-effective sources of abundant, reliable energy that have low or no CO2 emissions. That's just, that's the only way to do it because abundant, reliable energy is so fundamental to human flourishing, including the livability of our environment and the livability of our climate. So you just, you need to have that as a baseline. And then, so if you're concerned about CO2 emissions, you want to do whatever you can to facilitate the development of low or no carbon, affordable, abundant, reliable energy sources. That's what you have to do. And we've got this huge opportunity because the one that has by far the most promised nuclear power has a much better track record than anything else of being affordable in the past, except that it's been criminalized. So what we should do is figure out how to is define a policy for decriminalizing it and to make that the centerpiece of so many things. And you can see that there's there's just this, there's a really exciting movement developing, a, a pro-nuclear movement. You can see this with, we've mentioned on the show before, Michael Schellenberger. And Mike is doing really, really good work publicizing the benefits of nuclear and then also the many negatives of what I call the unreliables of solar and wind. And he's really getting... Uh, I think a deserved following, and and I can see just on Twitter, uh, among other places, that you you see a a lot of really smart tech people, science people, the type of people who who are concerned about CO two emissions. I don't I don't think they've maybe studied them. I don't think they have nearly enough precision about their magnitude and and a whole bunch of other things. But nevertheless, people who say, okay, this seems like a concern, let's figure out a truly efficient pro-technology, pro-human way of dealing with it. And then nuclear seems obvious. And then it's there are so few people who are pro-nuclear and you've got Schellenberger doing a really good job. So he's getting a following. You can see, well, Patrick Moore is getting a good following for a whole bunch of reasons, including for being pro-nuclear. I'm just, I'm just seeing this, the 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 anti-nuclear left is so vulnerable right now, and yet they've codified being anti-nuclear into the Green New Deal, which which really exposes it as anti-industrial, anti-technology versus pro-environment and pro-long-term thinking. So 
what what we can see is just there's huge there's so much to gain from being pro nuclear right now, and then I think more broadly should be pro human, but definitely this pro nuclear opportunity. So Republicans, if you're interested and you're running, happy to talk about the specifics of how to put together a nuclear decriminalization platform. But that is that is your silver bullet if there ever was one. There are a lot of other things you can do, but that is the silver bullet. Alex, let me just uh, one thing to clarify, um, just so that we're totally accurate. You know, the official Green New Deal does not take a an explicit position on nuclear, although many of its supporters do. Um, it was the initial FAQ that uh, Ocasio Cortez's office backed off on that was explicitly anti nuclear. Um, so we, we should. What what, the, what does it say right now? It just says a hundred percent. What is it? How does it word it? I don't know the exact wording. It doesn't it's have just, renewable in it. I'd have to double check, but the, the the my understanding is that it doesn't explicitly uh, bar nuclear. Okay, well let me let me say something about this, and then one of you two can look this up as we're talking because it is important to 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 clarify this right now. So I appreciate you jumping in. Just in general, this obsession with renewable needs to end. It's you know, clean is a problematic kind of terminology, but definitely renewable as an ideal, just throw that out. Nobody should be using that. If you're concerned about CO2, then you can talk about low carbon or no carbon. And then even then in practice, you have to be really aware of things like the unreliables using uh, generating a ton of CO2 emissions and people just denying that. They're treating they're treating renewable as zero carbon, which is a whole mistake, but definitely just this this dogma of we want technologies that somehow come from these sustainable natural sources instead of we want the technologies that now and for the foreseeable future can provide the best energy for our lives. If you look at the full context, the second way is the way to think of it. You, I've talked probably before, maybe not on the show, but you know, you don't want a renewable cell phone. You want the best cell phone. You don't want the renewable medical solution. You want the best medical solution. You don't want a renewable skyscraper. You want the best materials in your skyscraper. You don't want renewable energy. You want the best energy. Okay. Did either of you f- figure out wh- what it says in terms of the Green New Deal? So I'm not a hundred percent confident this is the final wording, but uh, from what I'm seeing, the resolution calls for meeting 100% of the power demand in the United States to clean, renewable, and zero emissions energy sources, which would seem to go to your point. However, so this reporter at least puts it that in lieu of a totally carbon-free economy, it sets up a net zero one where carbon emissions are canceled out, leaving on the table both nuclear and dirty energies outfitted with carbon capture mechanisms. So okay, that, that's not true. Though. That's not that that qualification that's someone's editorial right i mean the the low the neutralization i agree with like the offsetting and i'm sure there there would be plenty of those kinds of usually scams but if it's saying uh i mean they're talking about clean renewable like renewable is in it and it's it's definitely not including nuclear in any clear way i mean maybe somebody's saying oh there's a back door or something like that but it's explicitly saying it's ha- it has these attributes, which interestingly, none of the renewable ones have the attribute of being zero carbon. So it'll be interesting to see what they figure out with that one. Uh, but okay, so uh, I appreciate that qualification. We, we want to be as accurate about these things as possible. But I do think the, so the Green New Deal is overwhelmingly saying 100% renewable as the ideal. And this this ideal is portrayed other places. And there's just a huge opportunity to challenge that and to say, no, we are pro, you know, the best form of energy. We want the superior form of energy and that we think that nuclear can be that. And we definitely want to decriminalize it. And then if you really want to portray your opponents as maniacs, show that they claim to care about CO2 emissions and then oppose the best way to reduce CO2 emissions. That's the way to show them as clear maniacs. Okay, Stefan, what's your next story? I want to talk about a sort of forgotten renewable energy source, which is biomass. Uh, So over at the Institute for Energy Research, they recently had an article about uh, European biomass use, which in 2014 was 40% of renewable energy there. 
and is expected to reach over 50% by 2020. So it's the largest renewable energy source, although not as much advertised as wind and solar, of course. And it seems to be the fastest growing right now. And so the idea behind biomass as renewable is, of course, that uh, trees and energy crops can regrow. And as they grow, they absorb as much CO2 from the atmosphere as they release when they are burned. So they are sort of CO2 neutral. Now, there are some problems with that concept, of course, because other inputs like fertilizers and so on have to go into that process. But be that as it may. So... One advantage of biomass over wind and solar is that, you know, as a solid fuel that can be stockpiled, it can produce reliable energy on demand. And uh, But there's a problem with that, and that is scalability. So the Institute for Energy Research has uh, this England power plant that's using uh, wood pellets in, uh, in old coal power plants. Um, but it has to import two thirds of the wood pellets from North America. And this reminded me of some Danish energy statistics that I have to had to go through uh, not that long ago. And Denmark is also very big on, on uh, biofuels and particularly also uh, biomass for district heating and electric power generation. And actually biomass makes up a much larger percentage of total energy in Denmark than wind power. Of course, Denmark, everyone associates with wind power, but not biomass for some reason. And uh, so th this is just a bit anecdotal right now, but I think you can see a problem here when the leaders in adop adopting uh, biomass as a renewable alternative fuel have to import so much uh, biomass from other countries. This is clearly not scalable. You know, when America and Canada uh, go into biomass, where are they going to import that from, right? Where do you do you have data on the cost? Because anecdotally, I know some people who have invested in this, and they think, "Oh, this is fantastic!" Because these gullible Europeans with their renewable mandates are willing to pay a relative fortune for wood pellets. So, in the article, uh, the Institute for Energy Research says something like 1.2 billion. Uh, subsidies per year for this one giant English power plant. So this is, of course, government mandated and subsidized. And so this could be for, you know, some businesses, this could be very beneficial. Of course, the taxpayer will will be hurt by that. Got it. Well, this is an interesting example of the, the short-termism of meeting these different renewable mandates because the, the core idea behind the renewable mandates is that they are supposed to represent progress toward being have being powered by essentially a hundred percent solar and wind, including storage, you know, with some sort of storage mechanism. And that is not something that's remotely economic for reasons that have been discussed on many other episodes. I mean, the short version is just they don't give you energy at all when you need it. And to get it from those sources, you need, you need to just massively overbuild them so that so that at the maximum point, you'd have way more energy than you would need. And then certainly the minimum point, you'd have almost no energy or no power. And then you need some just insane amount of storage so that you could capture all of the excess energy produced and then deliver it when there's very little energy being produced. And as I, I've run the numbers on that. I mean, I said, if, if you wanted just, if you wanted a battery equivalent to one day's use of energy around the world, that would be a hundred trillion dollars by optimistic battery prices a few years uh, from now. And then that also comes from, uh, you know, that that's using fossil fuels to, to build all that stuff, not using the unreliables to build it, which would be a, a whole other thing. And that's, you know, that's, 25% more than the GDP of the of the world. So it's this thing that it's this very bad idea. And yet, so how are people meeting it? Well, they're meeting it through parasitism off fossil fuels by saying, okay, we're going to produce some wind, but we're going to have fossil fuels as life support all the time. So then we don't have to do this overbuilding of capacity and we don't have to do this uh, overbuilding of storage, which is extremely expensive because we got fossil fuels to back us up 
and to give us 100% reliability at any given time. So we can be a parasite in that way, or we can use non-scalable uh, plant based ways of doing this, which are not the publicized ways of doing this. So we can use things like waste alcohol, or we, we can use certain amounts of forests, and we can take advantage of the, the fact that people are willing to pay a lot for this for now. But I don't know of anyone who's really talking about, who, who talks about when they say the dream is saying that, okay, the dream is that we're just going to plant all of these trees and cut them down and chop them into wood pellets. And that's going to really be the world's energy source. That would be kind of an interesting thing to claim. And it, it it might, I mean, if you could do it, it would be an interesting, uh, have all sorts of pollution challenges with it, but it has a certain kind of plausibility. I think that the others don't, but it has very, very little plausibility. So you can see that nobody is really doing the core thing that they're claiming to do, which is power your life reliably with solar wind and storage. Don, what's your next story? So... In line with all of the mind-blowing cost estimates of the Green New Deal, one of the things defenders like Ocasio-Cortez have started doing is invoking this economic theory called modern monetary theory. And I think it's worth delving into a little bit without getting too into the weeds because it is sort of invoked to try to take away that as a criticism of the Green New Deal. And I just want to give you a flavor for how the people behind modern monetary theory will talk about its implications. So this is a professor, Stephanie Kelton, who's very visible in these debates. And she has a piece where she says, here's the good news. Anything that is technically feasible is financially affordable. Just pause on that for a second because my jaw hit the floor and I read that. But anything that is technically feasible is financially affordable and it won't be a drag on the economy. Uh, the federal government can spend money on public priorities without raising revenue. In other words, Congress can pass any budget it chooses and our government already pays for everything by creating new money. And like the, the essentially what the modern monetary theory argues, they'll grant that there generally there's a view understanding of economists and most people I think grasp this, the idea that if the government prints too much money, we're going to have inflation, which can be one of the most destructive things in an economy. And the modern monetary theory proponents will grant that that theoretically can happen, but they say it's so remote as to be meaningless, that essentially we have at our disposal the ability to have a free lunch by printing up trillions upon trillions of dollars. And like, if you think about the fundamental economic challenge that human beings face, it's how do we produce? That is, how do we take things, how do we take inputs and make them more valuable by rearranging them? And if you just look at businesses, most businesses get that wrong, right? Like they don't make profits because they're not actually making things that are more valuable. But if, according to the modern monetary theory, the problem is it's effectively effortless for us to create valuable things if the government prints enough money and like the without getting into the economic technicalities of it i mean the essential fact is that when you're printing money you're not actually creating new resources and what ends up happening is that you just have more money chasing the same resources bidding up prices and that's that's really the root of inflation and hyperinflation and the main thing I wanted to highlight, and this is one of the few times where I woke up in the middle of the night and had an idea, and then in the morning, it still seemed like a good point, um, that there's this essential similarity between modern monetary theory and the Green New Deal that it's used to defend, and that's both of them are threatening the stability of a fundamental system. So hyperinflation is what destroys a monetary system, which is the fundamental system making it possible for us to have an advanced division of labor economy where we're able to actually coordinate our efforts. And as we're seeing in Venezuela, when that breaks down, you basically wipe out the ability to have any sort of economy. It's not just that things are getting more expensive. It's that you don't have the kind of coordination that allows us to allows you to have an economy, let alone economic progress. And then the other fundamental system in economy, of course, is the energy system, which is you always point out, Alex, is the industry that powers every other industry. And that what the Green New Deal would be doing is weakening the stability of the grid. And I mean, 
we are also, as we talked about last week, seeing that in Venezuela where the, the grid basically collapsed and they had blackouts for days. And really the only difference here is that the Venezuelan government wrecked its grid through neglect, whereas the Green New Deal would be doing it as a matter of deliberate policy. Yeah, it's like uh, it's sabotage. So it's, it's like uh, you know, accidental fire versus arson. That's so Ocasio Cortez is like an arsonist, uh, but I guess who says she's going to build you an even better house? Yeah, it's interesting those that those two fundamental systems being attacked. Interestingly, we had a decade where those two fundamental systems were suffering mightily, and it was in the the public awareness it was in public awareness and that was the 1970s where you had a tremendous instability of energy supply particularly fuel supply for mobility because of the oil crisis which had a, a couple of different causes maybe more than a couple and then you had serious inflation and what people called stagflation it's interesting that it's probably not coincidental that those aren't on people's minds because they're 40, 40 plus years ago now. So it feels like, oh, well, that that can't happen. That was in the past. And then what happens is you get you get new you get new variations on old fallacies. And, you know, in this case, modern monetary theory, we need a new name for that because that's a ridiculous name. And just a that's obviously trying to obscure uh something. And so whatever it is, I mean, this is this is this is the kind of uh, free lunch theory that just doesn't recognize the, the nature of of reality, as you mentioned, the nature of economics, which is that you're you're trying to take, you know, your existing state of resources and raw materials, and then to grow it into a state of more resources. And just think about just think about a desert island. If, if you just want to think about this kind of simply like you're on a desert island and you have a you have some money system and you have a printing press and it could even be a sophisticated desert island but basically nobody on the island knows how to give you power with solar wind and source like they just don't know how to do that and it just takes up so many resources to even try that anyone who tries to do it starts to bankrupt themselves and then you just think like there's something wrong with the process. The process does not use resources efficiently. And therefore, the more you try to engage in that process, the more you're going to consume those resources and you're going to turn them from valuable to uh, less valuable. You're going to end up you know, generating a whole bunch of solar panels and batteries that really can't do that much. And you could have used the wealth for something else and the time that went into it for something else. So the fact that you can then print as much as you want on the printing press doesn't change the fact that the resource, pro the, the process for solar and wind and storage is really, really inefficient. And so that's when we're talking about money, we, we need to be thinking about what's the resource efficiency of the different productive or destructive policies taking place. And because there are so many of them and there's so much money, it's easy to just think, oh, it's all infinite, but it's, it's definitely not infinite. And you find that out when you make really, really dumb decisions. But money is not wealth slash resources. It's, it's a tool for exchanging them. And if, if you don't recognize the underlying reality that money is trying to help you deal with, then you're going to make very irrational and unjust decisions. Stefan, what's your next story? And this will be the last one. Okay, my story is about uh, an update on the program of blending gasoline with um, ethanol. And uh, so the EPA is currently proposing an expansion of that program. Uh, and it proposes to enable 15% uh, of ethanol in gasoline year round. Currently, it's restricted to eight months. And in particularly, it's not allowed in the summer season. And the reason is that ethanol blended into gasoline will produce more ozone, which is particularly problematic in summer, or is alleged to be problematic. Um, and so the ethanol production currently makes up about 40% of the American corn farmers produce, and thus it has some political thrust, uh, combining the green renewable fuel alternative narrative with uh, politically powerful uh, agricultural interests, of course. And I think this is generally a step away from energy freedom. And of course, refiners and fuel producers are uh, opposing it. 
it makes it more costly. They have to buy these uh, renewable identification numbers, which is essentially a green credit tag to the ethanol. And then they have to uh, show that they have blended sufficient ethanol into their gasoline uh, to be on the market. And uh, yeah, I, th I think that's a very bad development. And this is coming from the Trump administration, uh, which shows just how powerful the interest behind this is. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. How, well, I hope we don't get to see how this relates to Green New Deal because I hope Green New Deal gets destroyed. But there's, I, it's one one thing I want us to do is I I really want good data on, it, and it's going to have to be ranges of things. But I really want good data on the emissions profiles of all the different processes for generating energy because there's just there's so much wrong stuff out there. And just the view that, oh, buying a battery car is going to reduce your emissions in some, some substantial way. That's just, that's wrong in so many ways. And yet there's just this, this oversimplification where people say, oh yeah, well, as long as I use something that's labeled renewable or green, then I'm not generating any CO2. And that's, that's bad. That's bad because it's, it's dishonest. And if you actually wanted to reduce CO2, it would be bad. So as I'm working on the section of my book on CO2, I'm starting to think, oh, I really need to know what's the CO2 profile of these other forms of energy. I mean, so, you know, we know that there's a different CO2 profile of gas versus coal, although then with gas, there's concern about methane. And so how does that factor in? But I really want to know something like how much do the unreliables emit? at different kinds of concentrations and that that could, having that information could be very very valuable and it, it could help change this debate from this angel versus devil uh it's not even a debate but angel versus devil narrative that exists where okay you're using this one thing and then you're an angel and you use this other thing and you're a devil versus no we look at the the full impact of all the different sources so that's that's something to get started working on and of course we can talk more about that internally and then share our findings. One one final idea on that that I got from a listener or at least someone who's familiar with our work a year or two ago he said that we should uh we should have a metric of CO2 emissions that was relatable and he suggested uh actually I maybe I won't um give the exact suggestion cuz maybe we'll do it but he, he basically suggested take a prominent prominent emitter of CO2 and then make the make the metric in their term. So uh, I'll develop this a little more in future weeks and share with you the uh, the the full idea, but there's something there where we we definitely want awareness to exist about the full impact positive and negative of using different forms of energy and it's right now it's so slanted to only look for negative impacts with fossil fuels and nuclear and only look for positives with solar and wind and that helps nothing good in the world what does help good things in the world is looking at the full context from a pro-human perspective and that's why once again i want to recommend dr robert phelan's work okay that's it for this week. Thanks everyone for joining us. If you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, you can email me at alex at industrialprogress.net, don at don at industrialprogress.net, and stefan at s-t-e-f-f-e-n at industrialprogress.next. Next week, we will be back with some more great topics. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.